SJC 11952, Commonwealth versus Adam Lee Hall. Mr. Rasil, good morning. I'll just note that I'm aware that you had asked for an hour of time and that your client had asked for additional time to argue the Muffet, the Muffet motions. Uh, as you know that I, I have <coughs> denied that request, as you also know from being an experienced attorney here where, the, where one of us have, has a question beyond the 20 minutes, I almost never cut them off. So, uh, so why don't you proceed, use your time as wisely as you can and we'll see how long this goes depending on the questions that are asked. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, thank you very much. Um, and uh, may it please the court, I'm Attorney Jim Rasile. I appeared today uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Adam Lee Hall. Um, there is no question that the prosecution has considered Mr. Hall the architect, the mastermind, and the principal villain responsible for these grisly murders. In such circumstances, there is a natural human inclination to pull out all the stops in an attempt to secure a conviction and there is also a natural human inclination to tolerate conduct that may exceed the bounds of zealous advocacy. Were that to occur, it may be understandable in a case such as Mr. Hall's, given the grisly nature of the crimes and the depraved and hateful acts that constitute the crimes, as suggested by my prosecutor in the closing in this case, but it's not acceptable. It falls upon this court to police the bounds of zealous advocacy and to see that Mr. Hall is accorded justice in a fair and impartial proceeding, regardless of how unpopular he may be. This is what I ask the court today on Mr. Hall's behalf. I will focus on the trial court's evidence rulings, including the bad acts evidence, both charged and uncharged. I will then speak to the prejudi prejudicial joinder issue and uh, then speak to concerns about prosecutorial and law enforcement misconduct. As I proceed, and after the case is submitted, I know that the court will consider the cumulative effect of the prejudice that occurred to Mr. Hall, both before the grand jury that returned the murder indictments in this, in, the, in this case, and throughout the trial proceedings. I will proceed with a review of the uh, court's evidence rulings. And there's three categories I'm gonna speak to. I think a good place to begin would be what I'll call the Viovis evidence. And I'll uh, presume the court is aware of what I'm referring to when I refer to the Viovis evidence. And in this case, in particular, there were um, uh, three categories of evidence that were at, were, were at issue in the Viovis evidence, so-called. There was the spiked baseball bat. That's already been conceded. That, was, that should not have been admitted. And so that goes into the prejudice calculus already. Next were the photos of the machete, clever, uh, the cleaver, the hatchets, and the knives. And let me say on this particular case, in the Viovis case, um, this court found that those were um, uh, provided Viovis's access to the means to commit the murders, and that in turn provides a link to Mr. Hall that he also had the means and the knowledge to dismember the bodies, simply because a co-defendant had the means these photos, as the court will undoubtedly recall, were in Mr. Viovis' apartment. Um, I respectfully suggest that to uh, render such a finding on the photos of the, uh, of the weapons uh, to Mr. Hall uh, does come dangerously close to relying on guilt by association, which this court has already said cannot be countenanced. Didn't we have the statement uh, to Viovis overheard by another party? that he really enjoyed what he did, cutting them up? Um, yes, and, and it was, that was the linchpin that allowed for this evidence to come in to establish but the identity of the Ovis. But in this- have a third party who hears a conversation, not in the apartment, right? I think it was in a bar or something where this, this, this statement is made that your, your client makes it to the Ovis, right? And then they execute a search warrant much later and, and they find this evidence in, in which we talked about at length in Viovas. So doesn't that tie your, your client or isn't it probative of your client's guilt? 
Specifically, uh, Justice Gaziano, I, I, I believe you are referring in that case to the uh, photos of the anatomical drawings. That was the third category that, uh, in fact, uh, Chief Justice Gantz, in, 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 in the majority opinion of, uh, of uh, Viobis, uh, found uh, would come in uh, for three different reasons. Uh, the court in, uh, uh, in Viobis gave three reasons why the anatomical drawings would come in. And so if I could speak to that, the first point was a question of his identity. Uh, in this particular instance, vis-a-vis -vis Hall, there's no question of identity so far as Hall is concerned. The second point was state of mind evidence. Um, that, you know, what Viovis' state of mind. He said, what do you mean there was no evidence of, of, of identity on, on Hall? With respect to Hall, there was no, no issue of identity. To the extent that you're suggesting that well, it was was it, Wasn't it a whodunit? Uh, Hall's identity was not an issue. That was not uh, uh, um, establishing Hall's identity through the anatomical drawings in Viovis's apartment. There's no connection. I, I, meant, I meant identity as a perpetrator. Um, the uh, once again, it's it's Hall who's on trial, not Viovis, Your Honor. I, I, so, I get that. and I'm just suggesting the differences between Viovis and this court. And identity was but, not an issue vis-a-vis -vis Hall. But clearly, you have a, um, a, a stronger argument than, than Viovis because you can't impute one person's state of mind to another person absent, right? That's exactly the point I'm trying to make here. No, I, I get All that. Right? right? And it's in similar fashion with the state of mind aspects of it. And with respect to the third reason to allow that uh, anatomical drawings in vis-a-vis um, -vis Viovis, it was to explain an unexplained situation, the torturous aspect of the crimes here uh, uh, were an anomaly to the killing. And so it went to motive as an explanation as to, to explain something that would otherwise be un unexplainable. That was the third reason why it came in in Viobis. In they're, this particular they're charged instance, as joint venturers, right? That's right, Your Honor. So why, so the code, the other defendants intentions are relevant, right? I mean, and uh, I'm not sure why it's not relevant here when it's a joint venture murder. Um, uh, Justice Kafka, yeah. uh, I again would cite the, uh, what Ju Justice Gaziano just said, this particular argument is stronger in the Hall case than it was in the Viovis case, and that's exactly what I'm saying here. Uh, for instance, and, we, and we, have, your calculus. we have Commonwealth versus Keogh, for instance, where there was a uh, alleged gang incident and the police come in and they go to a co-defendant's house, and they find some anti, some gang uh, writings on the wall, and we said that wasn't admissible because there was no evidence that the person on trial ever saw those writings, ever adopted them. All right, there was just nothing there. It was just all state of mind for one person can't be imputed to another person, I, and that, I think that's obviously what you're arguing here. Exactly. But right. here we have that statement about cutting people up that your client says. Uh, and, and in Viobis, that was, that was the linchpin for allowing this evidence in vis-a-vis -vis Viobis. Right. Uh, it, it was not needed in this particular and, instance. And, and, so, and, and, and we, that, we have to go through, and I'm not sure all these categories of evidence were admissible against your client as well, because you can, you, can you can separate them out. Exactly. And we, we need to do that. Exactly. Did, did your client refer to the other guy as the butcher in that when they're, when they're joking around about it? Does your client refer to him as the butcher? Uh, that was disputed, uh, Justice Kafka. Well, disputed. Uh, I mean, on, hmm. at this point, that doesn't matter, right? It's the evidence in the light most favorable to it, come. It, it, it really doesn't uh, for the point I'm making here. So. Hmm. But, but it, again, when I look at the record, I'm going to find some testimony that your client is referring to the other man as the butcher, right, when they're joking around at the, at the I, lodge. Um, the, uh, assuming for the sake of discussion that that is in there, and I, and I cannot say as you're asking me that question if I can uh, really ask, answer accurately if in fact that is there. Mm -hmm. But even if it were there, it certainly wouldn't help, but it certainly would not be dispositive of anything we're saying here. Um, so um, that would be the Viovis evidence of what I want to say on that point, unless there's any questions. The second category of evidence rulings that I'd like, I'd like to speak to were, were the several um, requests for a mistrial that occurred throughout this trial. 
Had there been one or two over this two to three week trial, uh, I, I, I probably would not be making an issue of it. But in this particular instance, there were eight separate times that trial defense counsel saw fit to ask the court for a mistrial in the wake of the trial, the trial judge uh, sustaining the objection, instructing the jurors to disregard what they had just heard, and then at sidebar, denying the defendant's motion for new trial. I mean, the uh, mo motion for uh, uh, a mistrial. The, as I was preparing this, I was struck by the number of occasions in which objections from defense counsel were sustained, jurors were instructed to disregard what they just heard from a prosecution witness on direct, and nothing more was done. I probably, in retrospect, I should have made a note of that, but, but they're in the record. Uh, so in this particular instance, I'm not gonna go through all eight times leading up to it. Can I ask, on those eight times, um, were the objections sustained in each time and the jury instructed to disregard the evidence? Yes, they were, Your Honor. So there weren't any times where there was a motion for a new trial uh, based on evidence that was actually admitted? Uh, motion for mistrial? Right, a motion for mistrial where the evidence was actually admitted. I believe that that is an accurate statement from you, Judge, uh, Justice Kafka, and I will, I will confirm that. If it's, if it's not accurate, I'll correct that. What, what, was it uh, the, the, the main conflagration, I guess, what was the was the uh, police officer testified and used the N-word? Absolutely, and used the I was N -word. just gonna say that. Right. The, last two, the last two times this happened was with veteran state police officers. Um, <clears throat> it was, uh, you have to refer to Captain Smith, and, and Captain Smith. Um, I mean, and, and as you know, I mean, sometimes it's, it's tricky. You're saying this is all cagey stuff when the prosecutor says, you know, sometimes the, the result is to, to allow the prosecutor to lead the witness if it's getting in some problematic areas. But here you're saying this was all kind of contrived? Uh, I'm not suggesting that it was contrived. I'm simply stating what the facts were. In fact, what you just suggested is what did happen in this case when it came to Captain Smith. Before Captain Smith took the stand, defense, defense counsel was concerned what he was going to do. Probably had justification for it. That's not a matter of record. but and asked at sidebar, and there was discussion at sidebar about that, and my brother at that point said, I will lead him, and we'll handle it in that fashion. And notwithstanding the fact that he was leading him, Captain Smith, the commander of the detective unit out in Berkshire State Police, used the N-word in the way, uh, and, and that was conceded, by the way, by, by my brother in the, in the, um, 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 in, uh, in the uh, appellee's brief. They acknowledge that Captain Smith uh, uh, made those two misstatements. Um, there's, there's other evidence of racist um, attributions to your client that is admissible, right? His I, membership in organizations and other things, is that right? Yes, and those are subject to motions in limine that were allowed and there was some, uh, there was to be appropriate policing of that as the trial proceeded. But so yeah. it's, it's not gonna, this is not the only evidence of sort of racism related to your client. Uh, once again, Justice some Kaffer, of it, ad, Some of it's admitted um, in a structured way, is that right? Uh, it, it, and and I, it, I will, uh, I believe that that would be accurate and I'll, I'll double check to make sure that uh, it is, but even still, it goes to the calculus of the prejudice uh, uh, component that I'm talking about. And I will tell you that in the wake of what Captain Smith did do, uh, it's in my in footnote three of, of the appellant's brief, um, we see how the trial court uh, what reacted. Uh, his use of the racial epitaph in violation of my order was a serious matter, but the court did not grant a mistrial. That, by the way, was followed within an, almost a matter of minutes by the, the notion about 15-year-old uh, girls performing sex acts, which was volunteered by uh, uh, Detective Smith, and that's also conceded in the, in the appellee's brief. So I'd like to move on, unless there's any questions on that, to the third category of evidence, and this happens to be the six uh, recognized situations where evidence regarding other uncharged bad acts suggesting the motive for Mr. Hall to uh, off 
um, the, uh, the victim, Glasser, to, 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 to eliminate, to, to get rid of Glasser as a witness, those six categories of, of uh, testimony from uh, of uncharged bad acts, um, and those are cited in the, uh, in the brief, uh, my, 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 my brother in, in, in the appellee's brief acknowledges that, th that there were those six incidents. But, but isn't, isn't part of the problem is that this is what your guy does? So, I mean, um, and some of them, you, I think you have a point, but for the majority of them, his, his, you know, when he beats someone with an ax and then tries to frame that guy, it's kind of what your guy does. To the extent that the court or a trial court were to conclude that this is what my guy does, you are now running perilously close to What's convicting the, him as a matter of, uh, on character basis. If in no, fact it's, 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 and it's, I'm not, it's, I'm not it's his modus anything. operandi. He has, he, he does something, someone's going to testify against him, and then he takes these elaborate schemes to discredit the, uh, the victim. If I, if I may, Justice That's Gaggiano. Isn't that what happened? Uh, if I may, Justice, may, may, I speak, may I speak to that point sure. in the following fashion? You've got six incidents of uncharged bad acts here indicating that this is what my guy does. And so, therefore, that's the motive for committing these crimes. Did all of those come in? Uh, they all came in over objection. But okay. This is in the grand jury, I'm, right? I, I, I'm sorry. Before the grand jury and at trial. In fact, that the, before the grand jury, as you can see in the record, there was even more than this before the grand jury. Uh, I, 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 I apologize. <laughs> I, was, I was talking about the grand jury. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were at trial. Oh, no, 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 oh, no. I, I was talking about the grand jury. Because it I thought, happened in both places. I misunderstood you. I thought you were talking about the grand jury uh, evidence now. But doesn't, right. aren't these what you call, you know, uncharged bad acts, they're all references to his trying to undermine the testimony of the victim, um, right? So it's a continuous pattern where he's trying to prevent Glaser, is his name Glasser, Glaser, from testifying against him in these other trials. So it's, it's all a consistent attempt to, to, pr to prevent inculpatory evidence from being admitted, isn't it? Conceded. So, but does that change the calculus because it all fits into that pattern? Yes, it does, if I may. Go ahead. Right. The, um, these are uncharged bad acts that were introduced as evidence to, uh, uh, as motive evidence for what happened in 2011. Now, in this particular case, we're talking at the trial court, at the trial level now, all right? Because um, there were some grand jury ones, I think. Totally. Were, that in, I think, in fact, should, I think grand, probably shouldn't have come in, but that's a different issue. Yes, in fact, I will uh, point out, there was one in 2007 that had nothing to do with this that came in at the grand jury. Uh, so, but now let's talk about the trial court level, at the trial. You've got these six uncharged incidents that the Commonwealth was permitted to introduce, suggesting the motive for doing this. Let's put this into context. One of the charged acts, and this because the, because these uh, uh, these these cases were were uh, were joined, you had what happened in 2010. Look at the facts that were alleged in 2010. The the absolutely uh, incredible uh, story of the, the, the uh, machinations that he conceived of in, uh, in 2010, the, the creative style that he used to, uh, to, to um, uh, discredit Glasser. And, and so if you accept that that's coming in as charged bad conduct, because he's, he's on trial for those offenses as well from 2010, can you honestly say that this jury needed even one of those other six uncharged conducts to establish motive, and they knew what this was all about, let alone all six of them. And the other thing I'd point out, when it came to those six, we do not know as a matter of record so when relevant. those six occurred. Was that between 2009 and 2010? It, it suggests from the fact pattern that some of those, for so, example, the one where he's offered six, $6,000 or 3000 he went to one witness, would you offer Glasser $3,000? But these, these are all Glasser, right? They're all Glasser, okay. right. But the point I'm making is- That shows that he's obsessed with Glasser and, and keeping him off the witness stand, doesn't it? Um, and this is my client, and, 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 and he's the person I'm defending right now, 
and, and, and you're absolutely right, okay? But the point I'm making, though, when the, all of that stuff's coming in is, um, um, did they happen between 2009 and 2010? If they did, that may have been relevant to the 2010 charges, but not to 2011. We just don't know. And that's another fact that I just suggested. None of those six should have come in. Uh, and that'd be the, the last point I make on the evidence, unless there's any other questions. I would like to. But, but I guess I have trouble separating it out when the murder is the ultimate culmination of this strategy. And that's the argument the Commonwealth's going to make is that. Okay, he's tried all these other things, they failed, huh? So he has to end up killing Glasser to, to accomplish this goal of avoiding him from inculpating him, right? That's is the Commonwealth's it, argument. Yeah, so I mean, and, and there's some logic to that, isn't there? Uh, and it by may the be way, logic, can I, but it's can I ask one, one last question? Because I know your time's up. I don't understand the out of state issue. Um, that you keep arguing because everything is in state, isn't it? Is there anything in the murder that occurs outside of Massachusetts? He's buried in Massachusetts. The Glasser and these other two individuals are in an apartment in Pittsfield. Uh, I'm just confused by what is, why we're focused on the possibility of out of state. It's different from Jane's where the boy is buried in Maine and other things happen in Maine. I, I just don't get the argument. I, I must uh, be missing something. The, the point's taken. I was prepared to uh, submit on that particular issue. Yeah, uh, I don't need to belabor unless all right, I'm I mean, I had a couple of points to make on it. I can do it now or later on if you like. But I would like to, with the court's permission, speak about prejudicial joinder because I think that that is vitally important. Uh, I, I, I make an argument on prejudicial joinder in my appellant's brief. Uh, it, of the kidnapping case? I'm sorry? Of the kidnapping charge? Of, uh, on the joined of the kidnapping. Oh, oh, oh. Jo joined of the kidnapping Under charge, right? I, okay, there's two, there's two things. I, are you referring to the 2010 kidnapping? Right. That's my avail availment argument. Well, no, no, the, the, you, you argued that that was in, in, in we'll hear from the prosecutor, because uh, I'm mystified about that one, but the, um, the joinder is the, I thought you were arguing that the kidnapping shouldn't have been joined with the murder case. Um, I'm arguing, and what, what was argued at the trial court level unsuccessfully was that the 2009 charges should have been severed from the 2010 charges, should have been severed, and, and so all three sets of cases should have been tried separately. That's the prejudicial jointer, and that's what I would like to speak to with the court's permission. But I guess my question is, if all of those are related to the so-called obsession with Glasser, regardless whether they were charged separately, wouldn't they come in as, as evidence of his motive to kill? Well, let me, let me, if I may, with all due respect, answer your question with a question, Your Honor. Uh, and it would be the following. Let's look at 2009 itself, the kidnapping and assault and battery, just from 2009. And, 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 uh, and were that to be tried separately by itself, the question may be asked, would some of 2010 come in? Possibly. 2011, the murders, some of that certainly would have come. But in 2009, would the Viova stuff have come in? Would all the other stuff about other people who that were involved in a murder case? That would not have come in in the 2009 case had it been tried separately. And that's the question that was not considered by the trial court below when it did its analysis of prejudice. He is charged with all three sets of cases, and there's never been a judicial determination whether or not there was prejudice in the 2009 case by trying these together. And clearly there would be. And so for that reason, 2009 clearly should have been severed. And in a similar fashion, 2010 should have been severed. Because a lot of what happened in the murder one year later would not have come in in the 2000, some of it would have, but not all of it. Certainly none of the Viopis stuff in 2010. And so here we are, if in fact, if I may just follow this. That being the case, you'd ask the question, so what? We're talking about the murders and the, the stuff that he's really doing his timeline and so forth right now. 
2009 and 2010 would come in anyways, so what? Well, if I may, two points on that. Certainly, had they been severed and the prosecutor decided, let's do the murder case first, certainly some of 2009, some of 2010 would have come in, but Mr. Hall would have gotten a limiting instruction. It would come in by the preponderance of the evidence, but he would have gotten a limited instruction how the jury was to consider that. There was no such limited instruction in these cases as to how they were to view the 2009 and 2010 evidence coming in. They were not instructed. You first have to determine if you find by a preponderance of the evidence that it comes in, then you can consider 2009, 2010 on the issue of motive or what have you for the 2011. And oh, by the way, we are also prosecuting him on the 2009 indictments and 2010 indictments. So in addition, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you also have to make a finding beyond a reasonable doubt on that same evidence. I mean, and so no such instruction, no such limiting instruction was given in this case, and it really couldn't have. But the other point I want to make is, let's just say for the sake of argument, that they were severed. And the prosecutor chose to uh, try the 2009 first. And Mr. Hall is acquitted. Then, under this court's decision in Durazio, the Commonwealth would be collaterally stopped from introducing that in the 2011, in a similar fashion with 2010. And so you get a sense that on this prejudicial joinder alone, Mr. Hall is entitled to relief. Um, obviously, my time is, and your I time is up. By the way, you have you have ably argued and ably briefed, and we have read all 120 so pages as well as your reply brief. It's I'm not sure how long, so you'll have to rely upon that with regard to the, the balance of your argument. Unless anybody else has any questions. Justice, can you ask about the uh, can I make a couple comments on jurisdiction? Are you satisfied on that? Or? Satisfied. Can, right. I, I have read your brief. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Capeless. May it please the court. Berkshire Special Assistant District Attorney David Capeless appearing on behalf of the Commonwealth. I was lead trial counsel in this case. I, I would first like to clarify some of the factual situations that came up during um, defense counsel's argument. First, as to those prior uh, bad act schemes that he brought up, the six of them. First, the time period in which those occurred was explained during the testimony. All of them occurred after the first case and prior to the second case. They were all unsuccessful, and this is why you ended up with the second case, which shows the relationship of why uh, they did that. They were all about Glasser, about trying to um, uh, uh, go after him as a witness and his credibility. and. Um, uh, so there was a, a, a very clear connection to the second case, uh, which, which brought that up. I'm sorry, by second case you mean the murder? No. The first case was the beating, which occurred at uh, Hall's um, uh, uh, residence up in Peru. The second case is that New York um, uh, fake uh, attack scheme in which he ends up getting arrested uh, in Pittsfield. The third case uh, is the murder. So that all of those prior bad act uh, incidents in which he went to people to try to get them to claim that uh, Glasser had either tried to sexually assault them or do something of this nature um, were all about the first case and led up to the second because they were all unsuccessful, as was uh, one of the, uh, his attempts with uh, one of his co-conspirators in that New York scheme, the second case, in which his first attempt uh, to try to uh, lay it out uh, she rejected and said, that's stupid, uh, let's not do that. Um, also, as to the comments that were um, uh, made point of by uh, defense counsel uh, that uh, led to uh, uh, trial counsel asking for mistrials, uh, the court, trial court, uh, Justice uh, Judge Kinder, um, uh, at the time, noted in each one of those cases, they were unsolicited. 
And this was not something in which the Commonwealth tried to get these witnesses to set it. They either blurted it out or, in fact, as was the case with Captain Smith, it was quite contrary to what the Commonwealth was uh, trying to do. Um, uh, in response to uh, your question, there had been uh, prior testimony uh, about uh, Mr. Uh, about the defendant, Hall, um, using the N-word, in which when he went uh, after the murders and went over to speak with David Casey to enlist his help in um, burying the remains, he told Casey, among other things, uh, that uh, he did not mind killing the, and he used the N-word there, and I believe he used it again, you know, and a second time. So that was already before the, uh, before the jury. So the question became, as the trial judge noted, what was the prejudice to the defendant, even though some of these uh, uh, unsolicited remarks were made by witnesses? They didn't go to um, crucial issues in the case. Mr. Capus, let me ask you about the kidnapping charge. I'm a little mystified by what happened in a McCarthy motion and then what happens at trial. There seems yes. to be a little bit of a disconnect here. Um, so Judge Rupp looks at this case and she says, I'm not going to dismiss kidnapping. The invigilment is out. This is luring him to New, New, um, to New York. But the indictment survives to the extent it charges the defendant with enticing Glasser to drive to New York, right? And then at trial, we get the kidnapping charge is as to, is it Glasser or Glazer? Glasser. As to Mr. Glasser's arrest, the force being the, when the Pittsfield police arrest him for that, falsely arrest him for that right. uh, event in New York. So I thought that just that had been precluded by Judge Rupp, no? Judge Rupp, when she ruled, she ruled that um, the Commonwealth could not proceed on an inveiglement theory. I would point out to the court that even though the Commonwealth used that word, it was using it more in a colloquial sense, not in the, the way that the statute used the term as the third prong, three prongs, first, second, and third. The third one uses the term inveigle. The indictment uses the language only of the first theory. So there was no... The first theory being force? Yes. So she said that that theory cannot, she did not rule, she did not dismiss the indictment. So she did, she did, not, she did not rule about the evidence that we could use. So she didn't rule on force, that's what you're arguing? Yes. Well, in fact, she said there is sufficient evidence to go forward to that. But I would point out, more importantly, but, but there's that no, there's no case law that says that the police can su can supply the force for a kidnapping, right? Right. There's no case that says otherwise, right. and and um, I believe that uh, there has been accepted that you can get another person to apply the force, so that in the fact that it's the police um, gives one pause, but it, it it still fits within the statute. But what I wanted to point out was that at trial, defense counsel specifically requested the trial court to reconsider anew, de novo, a motion to dismiss uh, the kidnapping. On the fourth part. And, and uh, Judge Kinder said, I will do so, but I will base it upon the trial evidence, and at the conclusion of the trial, I will decide it then. I would point out he decided there was sufficient evidence it's going to go to the jury. Just as importantly, what had been presented to the grand jury was the same evidence. Those witnesses that had actually appeared um, uh, it, at the grand jury to testify. But it's still dependent on a theory in which the police, a false arrest, I mean, an arrest is made based on false information. That's the basis of the kidnapping charge. Yes. Right? So, so it's, every, I'm sorry. No, I, I just, is there any authority in the country that says that's a I kidnapping charge? I cannot cite to any specific authority showing this uh, kind of a case. Obviously, it is unusual. Uh, I would point out what's unusual about it is um, uh, the very specific steps that were taken to have it. This was not something that fortuitously happened as if um, uh, uh, Glasser had driven over in, in Massachusetts and ended up getting uh, uh, stopped for speeding. Um, uh, in fact, the uh, false charges in New York provided 
uh, the probable cause for him to be stopped, and then to have the uh, truck be searched where they found uh, the, uh, um, uh, the gun, the weapon, uh, that immediately caused his, uh, uh, his arrest. Nothing about this case is typical, but, uh, but what is more typical is uh, uh, husband and wife getting divorced over a child and one of the spouses claims that the other spouse has kidnapped the child, an Amber Alert goes out, and that person is then arrested. Is that a kidnapping on the part of the spouse who wrongly accused the other spouse? I think you have to um, look to uh, what obviously is going to be the prosecutorial discretion in that. That would fit in um, potentially. Um, uh, you're going to have to look at that and decide, was there really kidnapping here? This was the clear intent uh, of and the whole machination behind what Hall had uh, planned uh, was that uh, Glasser uh, uh, be arrested, that he be held, that he have charges pending uh, when he uh, was gonna come to take the stand, that this is what uh, uh, he had intended all along so that it, it goes with it. It's not something that happens to potentially uh, occur. Um, on, on the grand jury issue, um, there are two presentations, the two facts that were presented to the grand jury that would be troubling. One is there was a statement to the grand jury that when the defendant was 17, he and his brother held a guy for a few days and tortured him. And then there was another one that said he ran a prostitution ring, paid prostitutes in money, drugs, and sold cocaine. Um, I get the evidence about Glaser. I get the evidence about the guy that was beaten with an ax but those two seem like propensity evidence to me, and they were impermissibly presented to the grand jury. The Commonwealth would argue that they were um, in the scope of all the circumstances of what was presented to the grand jury. Relatively minor uh, instances. Okay. They weren't dwelt upon. Um, uh, they were, in fact, dwarfed uh, by what they heard about what actually happened. That, that goes to prejudice, right? And, yes. And what it would have influenced, I would say. The, what yes, have it influenced the Better if they had been left out. They were part of the written statements that had been given by these people in describing their relationship and what they knew about the defendant. I would comment about the... So with, before we leave the grand jury issues, I was a little bit confused about uh, the bringing the grand jury back. Usually, when there's an indictment, you would bring the grand jury back only for the purpose of bringing a superseding indictment. Correct. Uh, I couldn't quite figure out whether that was done here or why the grand jury was again reconvened after the indictment had entered? The, um, it was an ongoing investigation. The grand jury was told that. The grand jury sitting was extended by the court, and we continued the investigation. In fact, that investigation continued right up and through trial. Um, we had further evidence of a significant nature, which we went back to the grand jury and presented, and um, uh, I, I guess, uh, to say just out of caution, w we wanted the indictments, if they were to be challenged, to be based upon all of the evidence that had been presented to the grand jury, so we had them return a new set, recharging. That is what happened. So there was a superseding indictment? A, a whole set, yes. Was it, a was, second set was of it, indictments, was it, was that's it, what they were tried was on. Was it identical to the first set, or was it different from the first set? They were identical. Okay, so I guess I'm, I mean, that's the part that I'm confused by. I mean, yes, prosecutors would love to be able to have the power to subpoena through a grand jury in order to strengthen your evidence at trial, but you can't do it for that purpose. You can only do it for the purpose of exploring further that's charges. That's correct. We did not do it for that purpose. As we indicated to uh, the grand jury as we were proceeding, we still had not identified a number of issues which were the exact location uh, of the murder, um, the uh, specific weapons that were used, whether or not there was going to be any forensic evidence that would, could l further link the defendants, and particularly whether or not other persons were involved either directly as uh, uh, accomplices either before or after the crime, or whether or not any of the uh, witnesses who had appeared before them had in fact given uh, completely uh, full and true uh, statements to them. So this was still an open investigation. Uh, it had not closed and then we decided to reopen. It was still an open investigation. 
and we had intended to go back. And once we had gotten further evidence, we presented it to the grand jury. I mean, there, there, I mean every, every case should be investigated until the Commonwealth rests, but you can't use the grand jury for all of that. Right. So We didn't use the grand jury to develop evidence. Mm -hmm. We had the evidence and then went to the grand jury and presented it to them uh, because we had more. So this is not an abuse of the grand jury subpoena power? I, I would suggest about. not at all, because as I said, all of what we got, um, we already had. You didn't use the grand jury to develop additional evidence? That's correct. That was we already that we presented additional evidence that we had already developed as part of an investigation outside, outside uh, the, the use outside of the grand, the grand jury. jury right. Now, um, defense counsel made the statement regarding the um, so-called vaivis evidence of the um, uh, various items that were discovered at the apartment, that the identity of um, uh, Hall as one of the murderers was not in question. I would suggest that, that quite, to the, quite to the contrary, the whole argument before the jury was that David Casey was not to be believed, and otherwise the Commonwealth did not have any evidence directly linking um, Adam Hall uh, to the murders, particularly uh, forensic evidence. Uh, and so therefore, the uh, obviously Casey's testimony regarding what Hall had told him was a, was a linchpin in the case, and his credibility was attacked. And, and Casey, having testified that Hall told him that one of them, name unknown, had really enjoyed doing it, and then a later, um, Rose Dawson talking about when he and the co-defendant Shalou were celebrating it on Monday night at the Hells Angels Clubhouse, they talked about the butcher, that this became uh, important to, uh, to the credibility of Casey as to, in fact, yes, that is what Hall had told him to show there was this third person who acted with him. So as this court had recognized in the Vavis case, this matter of identity was a real issue. It's the Commonwealth as, uh, um, contention at this point that in the Veyovi's case, that was evidence at his apartment that he had put there. And so therefore, the crucial issue was weighing the prejudice against the defendant. And this court ruled that the um, uh, relevance and admissibility of that evidence, the relevance of the evidence overcame uh, the prejudice, allowing it to be admissible, and therefore it was proper evidence. In this case, it is not about Adam Hall. This was at a co-defendant's. So the prejudice is far less in this case than it was with, with Veovis. And therefore, uh, uh, yeah, but you, you don't, it's, hmm. it's not a, but the, but the not, relevance still right. remains. It's not a zero sum game because if, if it's not as prejudicial, it's certainly not as probative, right? Well, it, well but the Commonwealth's point is it is still as probative because the credibility of Casey was called into question, and this um, uh, uh, um, uh, supports Casey's retelling of, of Hall, telling him about the, uh, the one of them was really into it, and the butcher, uh, which was later stated to Rose Dawson. So both of their testimonies become very important, both of them being the two statements, in effect, by Hall, which corroborate his involvement with the others in it. So uh, obviously, um, uh, that is still highly relevant to the case. If the court has no further questions, I rely upon our brief. Thank you. Okay, we'll take, we'll take our morning break. Thank you. Thank you.